In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Shalom, dear friend. This is wonderful. We are here in Jerusalem, warm during the summer. And we want to welcome you from all around Europe and especially in the UK. Now, we have an amazing um, guest today, Nehemiah Gordon. We had him already, but this time he came to speak about his new book, which is called Shattering of Conspiracy of Silence. Now, welcome, Nehemiah. It's lovely to have you, you again. It's great to be here. I know. Um, Thank you for coming. And uh, so why, first of all, why did you want to write this book? Well, so the book Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence, the subtitle is The Hebrew Power of the Priestly Blessing Unleashed. And initially the concept was really about the priestly blessing. Mm -hmm. I had had this experience a number of years ago. Um, it was actually started out as a very painful experience, uh, a heartbreak, uh, mm -hmm. a girl who broke my heart. <laughs> and uh, I actually ended up going to the top of the traditional site of Mount Sinai in Egypt and praying that God would take the pain away from me. And it was, it was immense pain. I've, I've never felt anything like it in my entire life. And uh, I was up there at the top of Mount Sinai and, and uh, just praying and praying and praying. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, and to me this was very unexpected, mm -hmm. I uh, felt um, this wave of emotion wash over me. I, start, I burst into tears and I felt God reach down from heaven and take the pain away from me take it off my shoulders, and, and in my mind's eye I could hear him say, I'm going to take this pain and carry it for you. And from that moment, I was completely, um, the, the pain was gone. I mean, it, you know, there was still some amount of hurt, but it wasn't like I was seized with this pain anymore. And as I had that experience, uh, as I had that experience up on Mount Sinai, I realized that this is, I was experiencing God as my father. Now, let me back up a little bit. A few years before that, I wrote a book called A Prayer to Our Father mm -hmm. on the Hebrew origins of the Lord's Prayer. I actually co-wrote that with a Christian pastor named Keith Johnson. And you have to understand, for me, that's a little bit unusual. I'm a Karaite Jew. I'm not Christian. I'm not Messianic. Mm -hmm. So to write a book on the, what Christians refer to as the Lord's Prayer was kind of a departure for me. But I uh, did it really um, as this interaction, this interfaith dialogue with this uh, Christian pastor, from a Methodist pastor from the United States. And um, as we were researching this, one of the things that came up is how the Lord's Prayer opens, Our Father in Heaven. And I thought of that as a very Christian way to pray to God. That's how it came off to me as, because Jews wouldn't think of God, I thought, as Father. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously Christians have the theology of the Father and the Son, and so for me that was like an alien way to pray to God. And as I, we were researching it, I almost immediately saw that in the Hebrew Bible, in my Bible, the Tanakh, the, what Christians call the Old Testament, God is repeatedly referred to as Father. And so this aspect of understanding God has, had been lost from my tradition, and I wrote about this in the book and really connected that prayer, the Lord's Prayer, even though it's a Christian prayer, in content yes. it's completely Jewish. Yes, yeah. And as I, you know, I, I connected with that in kind of an intellectual way. And up there on Mount Sinai, for the first time, I experienced God as my Father. And that's what was so powerful to me. Now, you're probably wondering, what on earth does experiencing God as Father have to do with the priestly blessing? But from, from my culture and upbringing, my father uh, of blessed memory, who died last year, mm -hmm. was an Orthodox rabbi. And one of the traditions that we did growing up Orthodox is every Shabbat he would put his hand on my head and he would make the blessing over children that fathers all over the Jewish world make over their children on a Friday night. And he'd start off and say, Elohim May God make you like a Ephraim and Menashe. And then he would follow that up with the priestly blessing. Now, my father wasn't a priest, but in... So do they do that usually? Oh, yeah. In oh, okay. every, I mean, in Orthodox Jewish homes all over the world, uh, every Friday night, the father puts his hands, I put two hands, that's tradition, uh, mm -hmm. puts the hand or two hands on the head, and he says, Yisim Chalohim Kafayim and then he says the priestly blessing. Now, you might say, well, he's not a priest, he's not supposed to be doing it, and really what the, the, you know, the priestly blessing, for those who don't know, is in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 to 27, and there the children of Aaron are commanded, there and their descendants, to make this blessing over the people. Now, um, that's something that, that only they're allowed to do in the temple. Outside the temple, in sort of like a semi-formal context, anybody could make the, the blessing. And so my father would make this blessing over me, and I realized that I was experiencing God off of Mount Sinai, him reaching his hand down and touching me the way that I had experienced uh, this uh, priestly blessing. And I realized God just gave me the priestly blessing. Now part of the story 
is I'm up there and I'm praying and I'm feeling all this pain. I'm, I'm seized with pain. I, I'd never felt anything like it. And there are these, um, these people from Africa who are singing this song, and I don't understand a word they're saying except for one word in the, in the song they're singing. It's this kind of a cappella. Um, for some reason, I thought they were Kenyans. I don't know. They could have been from anywhere in Africa. And they're singing this song, and all of a sudden, I hear the word hallelujah, hallelujah, in the song, and, and they go on with the rest yeah, of the song. Away. And they come back to this word hallelujah every once in a while. Mm -hmm. And I realized hallelujah is, I mean, I obviously knew, hallelujah is two Hebrew words which is praise Yah. Now, Yah is the poetic form of our Heavenly Father's name. And the key phrase in the priestly blessing, when it ends, it's a three-line blessing, and each line of the blessing has God's name in it. And then after that, God says in Numbers 6.27, He says, And they shall place my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. So by speaking the name over Israel, that's how the priests start to bless God's people. And I realized these uh, Kenyan people had spoken God's name over me, and I felt the blessing like I'd never felt before. And at that moment, I said, okay, I spent a long time and a lot of effort in research, researching the Lord's Prayer, which is a Christian prayer of Jewish origin. I said, now I've got to go do the same thing with the priestly blessing, and especially this aspect of the priestly blessing, which is so central to it, which is the, the holy name of God. In your book, also, I had the privilege to read it, uh, yeah. which is great, because people is, is just being printed right. and is going to be... Um, to be released and you can you can go and order it on nehemiahswool.com nehemiahswool.com mm -hmm. uh, sorry ne nehemiahswool.com uh, right. and so this is amazing but the thing also who touched me is like you are starting we are starting to rediscover to sorry we are starting to rediscover the name of our father right. as Jehovah. And, and in a sense, it's never been lost. I mean, look, I grew up knowing, mm -hmm. knowing what God's name is, that it's the four Hebrew letters, yud heh vav heh. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem was that I had been taught when I studied at the Hebrew University, I did my master's degree there, and one of the things I was taught, that this was simply common knowledge, that, that the Jewish scribes removed the vowels from God's name and put in different vowels, the vowels of the word Adonai, the word Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, why did they do that? Because tradition around 1,800 years ago came about that we must no longer speak the holy name of God whenever we see it. It actually appears in my Bible in the Hebrew 6,827 times. And uh, 6,827 times, and every time we see it, we're not supposed to actually read it. We're supposed to insert a different word as we're reading the text. Even though it's there in the Hebrew original, in your English you usually won't find it. You'll find Lord in capital letters, which is what the translators were taught by the rabbis who taught them Hebrew. Well, so I knew what God's name was. The issue was I was taught that God, the vowels of God's name were removed. And, and for a number of years, I had this burning desire. This is before the experience on Mount Sinai. I had this burning desire to be able to pray to God in his name. And one of the things that really turned me on to this was, was um, a very good friend of mine who was, I kind of consider him my mentor, uh, this old man in Jerusalem. He uh, one day read to me this passage from an ancient rabbinical text called the Midrash. And in the rabbinical text, it said, why do we pray in this era of history, in this world, and God doesn't answer our prayers? And then they answer the question, because we do not pray using his name. And that blew me away. The very same rabbis who tell us, don't speak God's name, it's too holy, are telling us, but God's not going to answer your prayers because you don't speak his name. And then it goes on in the Midrash to say that when, when, uh, when the Messiah comes, and of course Christians believe come back, but as Jews we say when the Messiah comes, he'll uh, we'll th then go back to speaking his name. And I thought, well, all the things that are happening to our people today, I mean, this was back during the Second Intifada, and or actually it was before that, but even you know back in 94, 95, we had the bus bombings, and um, you know, and, and I started to think like you know if we had prayed to God in His name, would it have made a difference? And I'm not saying it would have, I don't know, but it it made me think. It made me think. I, I want to pray to my Creator in His name, and um, and but the problem was I was told the vowels of the name are not the, are the scribes took them out. It's different vowels. Now for those who don't know, uh, and I think you wrote a book on the Hebrew alphabet, mm -hmm. so you know this. But for those who don't know, the Hebrew alphabet is 22 letters, 22 consonants. Uh, the, sets, the vowels are actually a different set of symbols. or dots and dashes above and below the letters. And um, so, so the problem was I had the four consonants. I was missing the vowels, or so I was told. And I was told this is common knowledge. Well, as I was doing my research at the Hebrew University, one of the things I found is that, in fact, God's name, as it's written by the scribes, isn't written with the vowels of Adonai, the Hebrew word for Lord. That's factually untrue. They say that as a fact, but it's factually untrue. And, um, and anybody can go to a Hebrew manuscript and see this for themselves if they know how to read Hebrew. 
And the way it is written, though, is with one vowel missing. Now, I don't want to get all complicated and technical, but basically every Hebrew um, uh, word, there, there's a system of... In the of, Hebrew scriptures. Yeah. In the Hebrew scriptures, the way you write Hebrew is there are certain rules of how to, you know, just like any language has rules, so every uh, consonant in the middle of the word, if it, I'm getting all technical here, basically there was a vowel missing. Okay. And I didn't know what the vowel was. And I kind of felt like Moses, you know, there was this great movie, one of my favorite movies of all time. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the movie, the, the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. Mm -hmm. And there's this great scene where Charlton Heston is being cast out into the desert by Yul Brenner playing Ramses. Uh, and, uh, you know, after he kills the Egyptian. Mm -hmm. And Ramsey says in, in his, uh, you know, deep, uh, vo by the way, Ramsey's had a great haircut. Um, <laughs> Yul Brenner. And so Ramsey says, I commend you to your Hebrew God who has no name. And that's how I felt for a number of years that I've been cast out into the desert. I was wandering around without knowing the Hebrew name of God, of, of, of the creator of the universe that appears in the Hebrew Bible 6,827 times. And, and I prayed to God, please let me know your name. I know, I know the consonants. Uh, I just don't know what the vowels are. And there's thousands of combinations. There's, you know, eight Hebrew uh, vowels and a half vowels. So that's I, you know, I wasn't good at math in high school, but that's thousands of combinations, um, maybe hundreds if you uh, rule out certain things that are grammatically impossible, but still there's thousands, you know, hundreds or thousands of combinations. I didn't know what his, how to pronounce his name, and I really wanted to know. And one day I was uh, sitting down and I was doing some research um, as part of my master's uh, studies at the Hebrew University, and one of the things I was working on was proofreading the Bible. This was a, a job they gave me as a very junior researcher. It's really the worst job you can imagine. I thought it was, wow, I was so excited, I'm proofreading the Bible, like the ancient scribes used to do, and, and I was doing it with the most important manuscript of the Bible in the world. It's called the Aleppo Codex. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually in the shrine of the book, they call it, in Israel's National Museum over in Jerusalem, um, in, in, uh, in, you know, right next to the Dead Sea Scrolls, actually. Um, so I was doing this research, comparing a photograph of the Aleppo Codex with the printed Bible that they were creating, checking every jot and tittle, every dot and dash, all the little minutia that most people, you know, even if they read Hebrew, they ignore these things because they don't really necessarily even change the pronunciation or the meaning. And I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, I'm just doing my job and I notice it says uh, yud heh vav the holy name of God, the, of, the, of our Heavenly Father, with the missing vowel. There's a vowel missing. And then another time with the missing vowel, then all of a sudden I'm sitting there and I find a place where it has the vowel and it has the full set of vowels. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. The, it, it felt like almost like the scribe slipped up. I thought, you know, like how could this be? And just at that moment, I received a phone call, um, and the voice on the other end of the phone said, a, "A plane just flew into the twin towers." I'm like, no, that's got to be a fluke. That's how could what? No, and, I, and I'm a history buff, so I said, yeah, there was a a plane that actually flew into the you know the Empire State Building, and it's a fluke. And I go back to doing my work and thinking, okay, I, you know, I don't know what's going on there. I don't have internet at the time. I don't have, you know, really radio or anything. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, well, this is a fluke too. I found the name of God once with the full vowels. And the vowels were, with all the full vowels, it was written Yehovah, mm -hmm. which made actually perfect sense to me as a Hebrew, um, you know, scholar, because there are many Hebrew names that have our Heavenly Father's name in them, meaning they're mm -hmm. like what are called compound names. So like, for example, the name Joshua, which is of course important for Christians. The name Joshua is actually in Hebrew Yehoshua, which means Yehovah Yoshia, Yehovah saves. So it's Yeho, and there's numerous names like that. Yehonatan, uh, which is um, with his Jonathan, which is uh, Yehovah gives, Yehoyada, Yehovah knows. So there's actually a, a bunch of names like that where it opens Yeho, and so that actually made sense to me, Yehovah. But I said, okay, I'm, look, I'm I'm a, I'm like Gideon. You know, Gideon, he needed a second sign. He needed the fleece to be on the floor, and he said, okay, the first time, and I always confuse these, the first time I want the fleece to be uh, wet and the floor to be dry, and the second time I want the fleece to be dry and the floor wet, or, or vice versa. And I said, I need my fleece. I need a second witness here because maybe this is a fluke. And I'd already seen this in a different manuscript and thought, you know, I need a lot of convincing. That's basically what it is. I'm, I'm a very skeptical person. This is my, you know, upbringing, really, and my training. Um, and so I'm skimming through the manuscript, looking for a second place, and I eventually find a second place where it says Yehovah. And just at that moment, I get a second phone call. And I pick up the phone, I'm like, yes? And, and the voice says, a second plane just flew into the towers. And I'm like, that's not a fluke, that was on purpose. The first time, maybe it was an accident. And then I look back at my manuscript and I say, this wasn't an accident either. <laughs> uh, and to this day, I'm still, you know, I, this is something that's changed my life completely. 
And, and what, re, what I realized happened is the scribes were part of this tradition of not speaking God's holy name. And to prevent people from speaking the name, they left out one of the vowels. And every once in a while, less than 1% of the time, they slipped up and put in the vowel. And, uh, it, you know, and they never put in a different vowel. It's always that vowel. Mm -hmm. And I realized this is, you know, look, God's name could be anything. And, you know, any, like I said, there's thousands of possibilities. It could be yee he vee he. I mean, who knows, right? But the best evidence that we have, the way it was preserved by the scribes, who didn't want us to know what it was, but they still slipped up every once in a while. And there's at least three manuscripts um, that I know of that I can say for certain have this. Um, it, they put it, the vowels as Yehovah. So, you know, now that's a, that's a big deal because if you ask most uh, Bible scholars who are ep experts in Hebrew, they'll say, well, it's common knowledge God's name was Yahweh, right? Well, where did they get Yahweh? If you trace it back to its origins, mm -hmm. Yahweh, the first time we find anything like that, comes from a fourth century church father who's writing in Greek and is reporting a tradition of the Samaritans in the fourth century. Now, I don't know if, we, if the Samaritans in the fourth century even knew what God's name was, and even if they did, when that Greek church father heard it and wrote it in Greek, it was impossible. So one of the letters in God's name is the letter He, which is a huh, mm -hmm. like in the word house. Um, well, we, they don't have that letter in Greek, <laughs> in ancient Greek. So he had no way of really writing this in Greek, and, and that's what scholars point to. The, uh, this fourth century church father is quoting the Samaritans. So this is like, like third or fourth hand, and from an actual Hebrew source, an actual Jewish source, what we get is Yehovah from these manuscripts. And so, um, you know, my feeling is uh, this is the best evidence I have, and I've had these multiple witnesses pointed, pointed to it, and I was so excited because then I could go, go home and, 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 and call upon God's name. And that night, I remember, it was, it was one of the most difficult nights of my life. Mm. I went home and I, I watched those, those scenes over and over on the television and... and you know, they just showed it over and over and over, the broadcast I was watching, and, and you know, the, of the planes crashing into the towers and the towers coming down. And, and I thought about this, um, there's this concept in, in Judaism, uh, and it actually comes from the, the, one of the stories in uh, the book of Nehemiah. It talks about when they dedicated the second temple, mm -hmm. that they couldn't, there, there were people who were weeping and there were people who were, uh, who were joyous, and they couldn't distinguish them. And this is a concept in Jewish culture that, very often, weeping and joy can be intermixed. And that night, I had this great joy. <laughs> God had revealed his name to me, but I was also weeping. And uh, there was a great sage, uh, Nachmanides, who said, um, I'm misquoting this, but he says something like, um, like, basically, in the moment of our great joy, that's when hope is born. And that's what I felt happened. Now, let's fast forward 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, on so this was 9-11. This was 9-11-2001. Now, it was about 10 years later, I think even to the day, where I was talking to a friend of mine. I think it was the anniversary of 9-11. We were uh, actually recording a program. Uh, mm -hmm. I do this uh, radio program with Jono Vandor, Truth mm -hmm. to You, mm -hmm. and we do a segment called Torah Pearls, um, which is a weekly Torah portion. Mm -hmm. and, um, and on this program, like on air, he says to me, do you realize what this means, Nehemiah? I'm like, no. <laughs> like this, I'm sometimes very slow. I'm very good with details, but when it comes to connecting the dots, I'll admit sometimes I'm very slow. And so he says to me, do you realize what this means? I'm like, no, what does it mean? He said that at the very moment that those 19 men were shouting the name of their God, the creator of the universe wanted his name to be remembered. Now, what am I talking about? What does a Muslim say when they carry out a terrorist attack? Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. At that moment, they shouted out the name of their God and perpetrated these horrific acts. And at that very moment, thousands of miles away, um, this is when this was revealed to me, and, and, and I feel like this is God wanting this to be known. Now, there's a second witness to that. This isn't just about me. Mm -hmm. And the second witness is something that I heard about from my friend Keith Johnson, and I thought, no, that can't be true. But I went to Manhattan to see this for myself, and it's actually on the cover of the book. I went to uh, Manhattan. I heard from Keith about this um, church. He said, there's this church, and it was right next to the Twin Towers, and it's an ancient church and not a single window is damaged. And I'll be honest, guys, I was rolling my eyes. Like, come on. You know, this, is, this sounds to me like some urban legend. I can't, you know, let's, I got to see this for myself. So I go and I see the church and I walk in there. And at the front of the church, I'm blown away by what I see. Because this is a church from like the 1760s. It was where George Washington used to pray, the first American president. It's a historic church. It's, I believe it's the oldest active uh, like public building in Manhattan or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I walk in there, uh, this little, it's actually an Episcopal chapel, technically. 
Um, and I walk in there, and at the front of the church is this statue of Mount Sinai. It's a sculpture of Mount Sinai. And at the top of Mount Sinai is the name in Hebrew, yud Hey vav Hey. <laughs> and I'm walking in and I'm seeing this, and I'm like, wait a minute. I have this God experience up on Mount Sinai where the name Yah, the abbreviated poetic form of Yehovah's name, is placed on me, and, and I feel God's love for the first time as a father like I'd never felt before. And then here I'm seeing this other Mount Sinai, this sculpture, and at the top of it, in a church, in a, uh, is the name yud heh vav and, and then right above that, it appears a second time, two witnesses, a second witness. And that's actually what I put in the cover of my book, this yud heh vav from, that, from the 9-11 from the chapel. And I looked into it, and it's confirmed not a single window was broken on that day. Now, this is very powerful to me for two reasons. There's a verse in Proverbs that says, The name of Yehovah is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. And this building, this steeple, this chapel, is a tower that people literally, I looked into it and found out that there were people who literally ran into it in that day when the other two towers across the street were collapsing, and they found refuge in this place. So I feel like this is a geographical manifestation of that verse in Proverbs. The name of Yehovah is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. And the other verses in Exodus 23, Yehovah says, Every place where I cause my name to be mentioned, that's what it says in the Hebrew, to be mentioned, there I will come and I will bless you. And the creator of the universe, the father of all mankind, the father of Jews and the father of Christians, came there and blessed us in that place. And, and to me, that's, that's you know, two witnesses from two verses, and it appears twice in there. This is a very powerful thing. I think Yehovah wanted his name to be known at that very moment when the other people wanted the name of their God to be known and, and, and connected with that horrific act that was done. How will it touch the, the Jewish community? Mm -hmm. Because it's a big, huge it's, thing. It is a big issue. And, I, and, I, and my hope is that Jews will read this book, and I've actually already had... Uh, a Jewish uh, cantor of, of, a, of a synagogue in the United States and then a, a Jewish community activist over in New York and they both read it and gave very positive reviews. Mm -hmm. Now look, some Jews won't like it. And I actually showed this to a close friend of mine uh, in Jerusalem mm -hmm. and I asked him, you know, what do you think of the cover? And, and he's actually a professional publisher so I was also getting his professional input. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, uh, great cover, powerful images, but I'm offended that you put God's name on the cover. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's why it needs to be there. <laughs> We've, we've come so far in Judaism that we're now offended when God's name appears on the cover of a book uh, exploring the spirituality and, and significance and history of the priestly blessing, which, remember, ends with the phrase, and they shall place my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. He didn't say, and they shall place my, I don't know, something else. He said, my name. And we all agree our Heavenly Father's name is yud heh vav We might not agree on the pronunciation, although I could tell you I've, I've spoken to rabbis about this, and I've had at least one rabbi say to me, when well, you know, I told him, I've discovered this amazing thing, and I told him the whole 9-11 story, mm -hmm. and he's sitting there and he says, eh, uh, pshita, which is Aramaic for, like, you know, obviously Sherlock. Uh -huh. And I'm like, what do you mean obviously? He's like, of course that's God's name, but please don't ever speak it again. Mm -hmm. In other words, his point is like, you know, we, this is some big discovery that God's name is Yehovah. We all know this. I'm like, all right, well, you knew it, but I, you know, I, I, needed, I needed to discover this for myself. Sure. From, from, and it's not just a matter of knowing it, it's knowing how I know it. It's knowing that this is in the manuscripts that have been preserved. Now, here's an interesting thing. You ask, how did those scribes who slipped up and put the vowels in, how did they know it? Well, there's a statement in the Talmud, and this is why I have the title of the book. Mm -hmm. There's a statement in the Talmud, sages transmit the name to their disciples once every seven years. So the sages, they knew God's name. It, was ne you know, it was, became a secret to all of Israel, to most of Israel, when the rabbis forbade us to speak the name, it eventually became a secret, but the rabbis knew the name and the scribes knew the name, and they accidentally slipped up and put it in, and the, meaning the actual pronunciation. And that's why I call it shattering the conspiracy of silence, because it's time for this conspiracy of silence to end. God's holy name needs to be spoken, needs to be praised. You know, uh, uh, Solomon talked about when he dedicated the temple, he talks about if Israel's is far off and they've been cast out into exile, they'll turn to me and confess my name. It says in the Hebrew, confess my name and, or to thank the name in, so, in some translations. But speaking the name, that is part of this blessing. The Psalms that talk about praising the name, proclaiming his name among the nations. This is something that Jews need to embrace. I think Christians need to embrace, it, embrace this. This is not a book for Christians or for Jews. It's a book for everybody. Mm -hmm. I really think anybody can read this book. And, you know, and I've had some very positive. I actually, there was actually an ultra-Orthodox woman who read the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, she basically told me she didn't want her friends to know she was reading it. 
but that she had, a, she, you know, she said, I don't agree with everything you said, but I found this very spiritually moving because a lot of the things you said are obviously right, even though our tradition, and this is where it came down to, to a large extent. She said, I can't disagree with the facts. The facts are there. Uh, the difference is that you're saying you've got to follow truth, and I'm saying I've got to follow tradition. And you think you're more righteous because you're following truth, but tradition is our way of life. And we believe that tradition is what keeps us together as a people. Okay. I'm happy that she admits that and, and, you know, and sees that. Uh, to me, what's important, you know, and I understand that, to me the issue is when the Messiah comes or comes back, there's no question what we're all going to do. We're going to call upon the name of our Heavenly Father. You know, there's a verse in Zechariah, uh, I think it's 14.9, he says, and it uh, shall come to pass on that day, Yehovah shall be king over the entire earth, and on that day he will be one and his name will be one. We're going to be one. We're all going to call upon the name of the Creator. Zephaniah 3.9, one of my favorite verses, and I think yours too in, in, your, in your book on the Hebrew alphabet you talk about this, that on that day it talks about God will change for the people a pure language that they all call upon the name of Yehovah. It says literally in Hebrew with one shoulder. That means we're all going to be standing shoulder to shoulder, a line of people, and we're all going to call upon the name of the Creator, which I think is such a powerful image because you know at the Tower of Babel, we stood shoulder to shoulder, to, and it says to make a name for themselves. And in the end times, Zephaniah is saying we're going to stand shoulder to shoulder, not to make a name for ourselves, but make, to make a name for him. And that's why the name Yehovah, I'm sorry to my Orthodox Jewish friends, that's why it had to appear on the book, because we've got to get to that point where we're all calling upon the name of our Heavenly Father, where we're not embarrassed of the name, where we're not offended by the name, where we embrace the name, and love the name, the name that he said to the priest must be called over the people. So I hope that you enjoy this program. I did enjoy this program. <laughs> thank you, Nehemiah. We always learn. And thank you for coming again here and, and sharing with the people. And don't forget, uh, friends, we're living in the last days. You've been watching In the Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings, or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy-to-use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter Get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making... In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Shalom, dear friend. This is wonderful. We are here in Jerusalem, warm during the summer. And we want to welcome you from all around Europe and especially in the UK. Now, we have an amazing um, guest today, Nehemiah Gordon. We had him already, but this time he came to speak about his new books, which is called Shattering of Conspiracy of Silence. Now, welcome, Nehemiah. It's lovely to thank have you, you again. It's great to be here. I know. Um, thank you for coming. And uh, so why, first of all, why did you want to write this book? Well, so the book Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence, the subtitle is The Hebrew Power of the Priestly Blessing Unleashed. And initially, the concept was really about the priestly blessing. Mm -hmm. I had had this experience a number of years ago um, it was actually started out as a very painful experience, uh, a heartbreak, uh, mm -hmm. a girl who broke my heart. <laughs> and uh, I actually ended up going to the top of the traditional site of Mount Sinai in Egypt and praying that God would take the pain away from me. And it was, it was immense pain. I've, I've never felt anything like it in my entire life. And uh, I was up there at the top of Mount Sinai and, and uh, just praying and praying and praying. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, and to me this was very unexpected, mm -hmm. I uh, felt... Um, this wave of emotion washed over me. I, start, I burst into tears, and I felt God reach down from heaven and take the pain away from me, take it off my shoulders, and, and in my mind's eye, I could hear him say, I'm going to take this pain and carry it for you. And from that moment, I was completely, um, the, the pain was gone. I mean, it, you know, there was still some amount of hurt, but it wasn't like I was seized with this pain anymore. And as I had that experience, uh, as I had that experience up on Mount Sinai, I realized that this is, I was experiencing God as my father. 
Now let me back up a little bit. A few years before that, I wrote a book called A Prayer to Our Father mm -hmm. on the Hebrew origins of the Lord's Prayer. And I actually co-wrote that with a Christian pastor named Keith Johnson. And you have to understand, for me, that's a little bit unusual. I'm a Karaite Jew. I'm not Christian. I'm not Messianic. Mm -hmm. So to write a book on the, what Christians refer to as the Lord's Prayer was kind of a departure for me. But I uh, did it really um, as this interaction, this interfaith dialogue with this uh, Christian pastor from, a Methodist pastor from the United States. And um, as we were researching this, one of the things that came up is how the Lord's Prayer opens, our Father in Heaven. And I thought of that as a very Christian way to pray to God. That's how it came off to me as, because Jews wouldn't think of God, I thought, as Father. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously Christians have the theology of the Father and the Son. And so for me, that was like an alien way to pray to God. And as I, we were researching it, I almost immediately saw that in the Hebrew Bible, in my Bible, the Tanakh, the, what Christians call the Old Testament, God is repeatedly referred to as Father. And so this aspect of understanding God has, had been lost from my tradition. And I wrote about this in the book and really connected that prayer, the Lord's Prayer, even though it's a Christian prayer, in content it's completely Jewish. Yes, yeah. And as I, you know, I, I connected with that in kind of an intellectual way. And up there on Mount Sinai, for the first time, I experienced God as my Father. And that's what was so powerful to me. Now, you're probably wondering, what on earth does experiencing God as Father have to do with the priestly blessing? But from, from my culture and upbringing, my father uh, of blessed memory, who died last year, mm -hmm. was an Orthodox rabbi. And one of the traditions that we did growing up Orthodox is every Shabbat, he would put his hand on my head and he would make the blessing over children that fathers all over the Jewish world make over their children on a Friday night. And he'd start off and say, May God make you like a Ephraim and Menashe. And then he would follow that up with the priestly blessing. Now, my father wasn't a priest, but in... So do they do that usually? Oh, yeah. In oh, okay. every, I mean, in Orthodox Jewish homes all over the world, uh, every Friday night, the father puts his hands, I put two hands, that's tradition, mm -hmm. uh, puts the hand or two hands on the head, and he says, And then he says the priestly blessing. Now, you might say, well, he's not a priest, he's not supposed to be doing it. And really, what the, the, you know, the priestly blessing, for those who don't know, is in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 to 27. And there, the children of Aaron are commanded, there and their descendants, to make this blessing over the people. Now, um, that's something that, that only they're allowed to do in the temple. Outside the temple, in sort of like a semi-formal context, anybody could make the, the blessing. And so my father would make this blessing over me, and I realized that I was experiencing God off of Mount Sinai, him reaching his hand down and touching me, the way that I had experienced uh, this uh, priestly blessing, and I realized God just gave me the priestly blessing. Now, part of the story is I'm up there and I'm praying and I'm feeling all this pain. I'm, I'm seized with pain. I'd never felt anything like it. And there are these, um, these people from Africa who are singing this song, and I don't understand a word they're saying except for one word in the, in the song they're singing. It's this kind of a cappella. Um, for some reason, I thought they were Kenyans. I don't know. They could have been from anywhere in Africa. And they're singing this song, and all of a sudden, I hear the word hallelujah. Hallelujah in the song, and, and they go on with the rest yeah, of the song, away. and they come back to this word hallelujah every once in a while, mm -hmm. and I realized hallelujah is, I mean, I obviously knew, hallelujah is two Hebrew words, which is praise Yah. Now, Yah is the poetic form of our Heavenly Father's name, mm -hmm. and the key phrase in the priestly blessing when it ends, it's a three-line blessing, and each line of the blessing has God's name in it, and then after that, God says in Numbers 6.27, He says, and they shall place my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. So by speaking the name over Israel, that's how the priests start to bless God's people. And I realized these uh, Kenyan people had spoken God's name over me, and I felt a blessing like I'd never felt before. And at that moment, I said, okay, I spent a long time and a lot of effort in research, researching the Lord's Prayer, which is a Christian prayer of Jewish origin. I said, now I've got to go do the same thing with the priestly blessing, and especially this aspect of the priestly blessing, which is so central to it, which is the, the holy name of God. In your book, so I had the privilege to read it, uh, yeah. which is great because people is, is just being printed right. and is going to be um, to be released, and you can you can go and order it on nehemiahswool.com. Nehemiahswool.com. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, ne nehemiahswool.com. Uh, right. And so this is amazing. But the thing also who touched me is like you are starting. We are starting to rediscover it. Sorry. We are starting to rediscover the name of our father right. as Jehovah. And, and in a sense, it's never been lost. I mean, look, I grew up knowing, mm -hmm. knowing what God's name is, that it's the four Hebrew letters, Yud-Heh, Vav-Heh. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem was 
that I had been taught when I studied at the Hebrew University. I did my master's degree there. And one of the things I was taught that this was simply common knowledge that, that the Jewish scribes removed the vowels from God's name and put in different vowels, the vowels of the word Adonai, the word Lord. Now, why did they do that? Because tradition around 1,800 years ago came about that we must no longer speak the holy name of God. Whenever we see it, it actually appears in my Bible in the Hebrew 6,827 times. And uh, 6,827 times, and every time we see it, we're not supposed to actually read it. We're supposed to insert a different word as we're reading the text. Even though it's there in the Hebrew original, in your English you usually won't find it. You'll find Lord in capital letters, which is what the translators were taught by the rabbis who taught them Hebrew. Well, so I knew what God's name was. The issue was I was taught that God, the vowels of God's name were removed. And, and for a number of years I had this burning desire. This is before the experience on Mount Sinai. I had this burning desire to be able to pray to God in his name. And one of the things that really turned me on to this was, was um, a very good friend of mine who was, I kind of consider him my mentor, uh, this old man in Jerusalem. He uh, one day read to me this passage from an ancient rabbinical text called the Midrash. And in the rabbinical text, it said, why do we pray in this era of history, in this world, and God doesn't answer our prayers? And then they answer the question, because we do not pray using his name. And that blew me away. The very same rabbis who tell us, don't speak God's name, it's too holy, are telling us, but God's not going to answer your prayers because you don't speak his name. And then it goes on in the Midrash to say that when... When, uh, when the Messiah comes, and of course Christians believe come back, but as Jews we say when the Messiah comes, he'll uh, we'll th then go back to speaking his name. And I thought, well, all the things that are happening to our people today, I mean, this was back during the Second Intifada, and or actually it was before that, but even you know, back in 94, 95, we had the bus bombings, and, um, you know, and, and I started to think, like, you know, if we had prayed to God in his name, would it have made a difference? And I'm not saying it would have, I don't know, but it, it made me think, it made me think, I, I want to pray to my Creator in his name. And, um, and, but the problem was, I was told the vowels of the name are not the, are the scribes took them out. It's different vowels. Now, for those who don't know, uh, and I think you wrote a book on the Hebrew alphabet, mm -hmm. so you know this, but for those who don't know, the Hebrew alphabet is 22 letters, 22 consonants. Uh, the, sets, the vowels are actually a different set of symbols, or dots and dashes above and below the letters. And um, so, so the problem was, I had the four consonants, I was missing the vowels, or so I was told. And I was told this is common knowledge. Well, as I was doing my research at the Hebrew University, one of the things I found is that, in fact, God's name, as it's written by the scribes, isn't written with the vowels of Adonai, the Hebrew word for Lord. That's factually untrue. They say that as a fact, but it's factually untrue. And, um, and anybody can go to a Hebrew manuscript and see this for themselves if they know how to read Hebrew. And the way it is written, though, is with one vowel missing. Now, I don't want to get all complicated and technical, but basically every Hebrew um, uh, word, there, there's a system of... In the of, Hebrew scriptures. Yeah. In the Hebrew scriptures, the way you write Hebrew is there are certain rules of how to, you know, just like any language has rules, so every uh, consonant in the middle of the word, if it's, 